officially open our hearing on April 12th, 2022 at 6.38 p.m. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go right into discussion with our applicants um, to fill the vacancy of a commissioner seat. What I thought um, I would do is um, Carl, who's not with us, had prepared just a brief overview for the applicants. And then um, as posted, we'll just kind of go through the order of go, which will be Michael, Steve, and Jay. So I'm just going to kind of read verbatim of what um, Carl had, had drafted for us. Just a brief overview for the Littleton Conservation Commission. Um, our conservation agent is Amy Green. The Conservation Commission has six voting members. We currently have no associate members, which are non-voting member, although we are allowed to have two associate members. We share our knowledge as we all come from different disciplines. Myself, Sarah Seward, is chairperson, um, and Chase Herbig is um, vice chairman. Andrew Smarco is clerk for the commission. Um, historically, we meet every other Tuesday throughout the year, starting at 730 we have the meetings um, recorded via Zoom for the last two years. The state will dictate when we resume in-person meetings. Um, we occasionally have to meet with the Littleton Select Board to explain projects or give them feedback on such. Um, site reviews, field and site visits attended as uh, necessary to gain field knowledge and uh, the proposed activity in front of the Conservation Commission. Trainings, commissioners are eligible for courses throughout the Mass Association of Conservation Commissioners and are also able to attend the annual conference. Um, town pays for us to do so. Jurisdiction, so we're gonna highlight some of the bulleted points responsible for implementing the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Our jurisdiction is 100 feet from the delineated wetlands line. Any dirt disturbance within that area, including construction activities, tree clearing, filling, uh, requires a conservation commission action. Town bylaw is more stringent and states that no activity is allowed within 50 feet of the delineated wetlands unless a variance is issued by the commission, the conservation commission. We also regulate the riverfront area, which extends 200 feet from the delineated bank of the river. We also regulate 100 feet from the delineated edge of a water body, such as a pond, lake, or perennial stream. We also regulate certified vernal pools in the adjacent immediate upland areas surrounding them. And we're responsible for all town owned conservation lands, which includes management of the lands. So for our partnering, um, we work hard in hand with the Littleton Conservation Trust, which is a private nonprofit that helps protect land, manage uh, land, manage lands in Littleton. We also partner with volunteer land stewards who are assigned to each conservation land in town, and they help to manage those individual parcels. We also work with the Sudbury Valley Trustees, a nonprofit that work to protect the Sudbury River, Assabet River, and Concord River watersheds. Um, grant opportunities, we also can apply for grants through the state and other opportunities for resource management in the protected funds. So... That is a brief overview of what we do all the time. Um, so what we'd like to do is, Michael, you're here? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. So, Michael, we have um, just roughly prepared four questions and just kind of wanted to kind of walk you through that. It'll be the same questions for everyone. Um, so basically, we would like to know what's your favorite conservation area in the town of Littleton? Uh, my favorite conservation area, I'm going to have to say Forge Pond. Uh, if we're, uh, you know, handling things within 100 feet, uh, I spend a lot of my time uh, doing that. Um, I do, uh, I am a member of the Friend of Forge Pond board. I'm a, the treasurer and uh, we do a, an awful lot to maintain that space. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, why do you wish to serve on, a, on our commission? Um, well, I, I really enjoy being in the town and love uh, the uh, the natural beauty of it. I was recently in Charlestown and uh, uh, enjoy the switch. I, I wanted the kids to learn their birds. So, uh, um, but I'm, as I mentioned in my note, I was a Boy Scout for years and years and uh, appreciate maintaining the, uh, the beauty that we have. Uh, I love being in Littleton. I want to do what I can. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you touched on a, a little bit about Forge Pond. Can you tell us about other volunteer organizations or public involvement perhaps that you've had? Um, it's pretty much what it's been for quite some time. Uh, more focused on uh, career up till now. Wonderful. Um, we mentioned briefly about our Wetlands Protection Act. Are you familiar at all with the wetlands regulations here in the Commonwealth or within the town? Uh, I am to a certain degree. Um, I think uh, we had to uh, work within them for uh, work we're having do, uh, done on our home. Uh, but, uh, you know, the extent of my knowledge is, you know, things that are within 100 feet of uh, like the lake here, for example, um, need to be assessed first. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. So those are kind of the standard questions. I ask our commissioners if there's any question um, that you might have for Michael. Um, if not, Michael, if you want to just spend a few minutes and just tell us a little bit um, more about yourself, that would be awesome. Commissioners, anyone have any questions? I did have one question, Sarah. That's um, uh, uh, Michael, to the extent that you've been involved in uh, either as an applicant or as a uh, someone sitting on a decision-making body like a board or a committee, what do you think makes those committees work well or work poorly? And I'm particularly interested in, in your, it sounds like you've been through some applications with the CONSCOM, but uh, it doesn't have to be restricted to that. Um, I guess, you know, the answer is going to be the same on a, a commission or a body as in business, having good communication and a clear understanding on all sides of what uh, what the matter is. Uh, you know, if we're not all speaking the same language, uh, it's hard to come to a successful conclusion. So my goal is to maintain that clarity to the best that I can and um, help promote that and keep the conversation moving uh, smoothly. Wonderful. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Thank you for Chase. Any other commissioners have any other questions? So Michael, if you want to just take a, you know, just take a minute or two and just tell us a little bit about yourself or, or anything else that it's hard with Zoom. We're so used to having everyone just kind of in front of us and just kind of rolling with that. But um, we certainly appreciate you being here and we'd love to know if there's anything you'd like to share. Sure. Well, we all do the best we can. Um, <laughs> But um, uh, a little bit about myself. I've been a software engineer for uh, my whole career, and uh, um, it's something that I've gotten a great deal of satisfaction from. And uh, uh, like I said, <clears throat> uh, I was a scout for many years and enjoy being in, uh, in nature and, uh, you know, learning the birds and uh, all the critters around. And we certainly have plenty of them here. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, so I enjoy sailing uh, on our lake. Um, um, I enjoy running when I can. In fact, the last time I saw Chase, he was running by me fast uh, in the Boston Marathon last year. Um, but uh, yeah, I've uh, uh, been in Littleton, I guess, eight years now. This is my uh, going into our ninth year. And um, I appreciate the community here and really being able to know people. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, Springdale is around the corner from us. And, you know, it's great to know Jamie and be able to, you know, talk with her and understand what she's doing and, uh, and be part of it. So uh, as I ease out of my career, um, I want to be able to ease into something where I can, um, you know, serve my family and serve my community. Uh, and that's why I'm here today. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Any other commissioners have any questions? Okay. So I think you're aware we're under kind of a, a tight time frame tonight. So we will bid, bid you adieu and, and kind of move on from here. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Thank much. you very much for joining us. Thank okay. you. Okay. Wonderful. And, and Sarah, I, I also don't know if, if you want to mention that these guys are obviously more than welcome to stick around for the rest oh, of the absolutely. week. Oh, absolutely. Yes. As much or as little as you can stand. So you got I think I'm on the uh, agenda later too. So uh, I, that's I true. You are. Around. You are. Yep. Yep. No, wonderful. Thank you for that. Yep. It's a perfect night to kind of sit around and, and watch as well. Um, Steve or Stephen, are, are you with us? 
Yes, I am. Hello. Okay, wonderful. What do you, you prefer to be called, Steve? Steve is fine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we kind of follow the the same format. So I guess I would ask you, what's your favorite conservation area in town? Uh, well, though maybe not some areas technically are conservation, although I think they probably are. I would have to say any part of uh, the Beaverbrook area. My my property abuts Beaverbrook. Uh, my wife and I spend time on it uh, kayaking when we can or um, even uh, cross-country skiing when it's frozen. Um, and uh, we enjoy all the wildlife that it brings. Um, we enjoy the birds, probably 30 to 40 different species of birds we have in our yard routinely as a result. So um, we just, uh, that, that wetland area is... Uh, just very alive and it's uh we love it that's great we hope hope to keep it flourishing for sure me too um tell us kind of like what's your motivation to wish to kind of serve on on a board such as ours steve uh well um i'd have to say it has something to do with seeing some of the construction that has gone on and wondering why it was i don't want to say allowed but I, uh, uh, you know, I, I would be more on the, I would err on the side of conservation in most of these situations and, and try to uh, limit what is done. Um, I've seen large areas just wiped out, trees taken out. Uh, there's, a, there's a development not far from us that went in a few years ago uh, with about a dozen homes in a tight area. And they just, they completely destroyed the habitat of everything that was there. Um, and I, it made me sick. Um, I don't know what the, the commission's official stance was on the Whitcomb Ave, uh, treatment site, but I, I miss that field already watching those concrete blocks going up in there. And, um, we used to watch deer and, and fox out on that field. And I don't know if we're going to see them out there again. Uh, so I think my, my, inclination is just to try to keep what we have, keep everything as natural and, and uh, country-like as we can. I grew up closer to the city. I've lived here now almost 27 years. Um, one traffic light when we bought our house in the whole town. Um, and it's, it's different. And I'm, I want to try to slow down that change if I can. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background with any other volunteer organizations or um, um, pub public involvement that you've had? Uh, really very little. This is my first foray into it. Um, okay. I was uh, prodded a little bit by a neighbor and, and by my wife to uh, take a stab at this. That's great. Super. Um, do you have... It sounds as though you're, you've been following some of the developments. Do you have any experience in reviewing or working with the Wetlands Protection Act and some of the bylaws here in town? Uh, I do not. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. So I would like to ask any of the commissioners if they have any questions, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> for Steve. <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll ask you one, Steve, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a different one than I gave Mike because... Uh, so always easier for the succulent applicants. Um, sure. Talk to me a little bit about some point in your past uh, career-wise or in any setting really, where you've had to uh, maybe give someone bad news or, or disagree with their position. Uh, even if you maybe internally agreed with it, you really wanted them to be right, but you, but you had to disagree with them. Talk me through your, how you sort of work through those disagreements with folks. And, and I ask that, I'm going to give you a little preface, because we often have projects in front of us where we may disagree with folks from a regulatory standpoint, even though we want to see it go forward, or the, the opposite can be true. We don't want to see it go forward, and yet we have to approve it from a regulatory context. So talk to me through how you sort of handle the, a situation like that in the past of juggling mm -hmm. a disagreement with someone. Okay. Uh, well, I'd have to probably uh, refer to something that sticks out in my movie buff history. And that would be something from uh, the, the Star Trek series where the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. 
Uh, there are there are obviously times when somebody wants something because it's going to benefit them, and they may be falling short of what you know that they're not seeing the big picture and how it's going to affect so many others. Um, I can't really give you an instance of that because uh, I, I don't know. Nothing's really coming to mind right now, but um, uh, I I would certainly be looking to keep the the greater good in mind rather than let somebody run roughshod over, you know, even, even if the regulation says they can. Uh, does that answer the question, Mike? I, yeah, sure. no, I don't know if there was a wrong answer. Um, thank you. No problem. Steve, you want to take a moment and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm originally from Newton, Mass. Um, been uh, here in Littleton, as I said, for 27 years. I'm a mechanical engineer by college degree, um, not really practicing. I'm working for a software company in Waltham. Um, and uh, I'm technical and hobby oriented. I have a 3D printer in my basement. I have a an old car. Um, I have uh, other hobby equipment that I play around with all the time. Uh, I'm also, uh, as Michael had mentioned, looking towards the retirement period of my life and wondering what I'm going to do when I walk away from my job. Uh, and this is, this could be something that could uh, take up uh, some of my time and, and benefit the community and benefit the, the, uh, the, public areas of the town and keep things natural and keep the animals around and make people happy. We hope. That's great. Thank you. Do you have any questions of us? Uh, no, actually I, well, I read the, um, the agenda uh, or at least scanned the agenda to see what types of things you're um, reviewing and, and dealing with. And that was, that gave me great insight into uh, what type of things you're doing. Um, okay, and that's I, great. I believe well, we have, I had a I had your stamp of approval on my recent shed edition. That, that's great. Well, as always, um, we appreciate you spending time with us this evening, and, and welcome you Thank to you. to stay on and and even at the end, if you have any questions, we're we're happy to answer any questions that you might have as well. I will listen for a bit. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, is Jay with us? Uh, nope, I haven't okay. heard back from. I know his some of his. Emails is having a hard time getting through, but I just sent another one and. Okay. Well, no worries with that. Um, okay. So let's see where. One clarification question. Sorry, before you sure. move on. I just want to make sure I understand it. At one point we had four applicants. The fourth applicant withdrew. Is that right? Or. Yes. Okay. Yeah, she did. She, she realized she didn't have the time. Okay. Great. So I would, because we do have an extra few minutes, I would go back and see that Michael and, and Steve, you're still here. Um, perfect opportunity as we want to talk about time commitments or to see if you have any other questions for the commission. So we stated that we try and meet, it's almost every, every two weeks. And then we do have site visits, site visits, um, on occasion, I wouldn't say they're every week, but sometimes we try and plan them where we can do perhaps two on the same day. Um, we do have to work around engineers so and also daylight as well. So there are times that it may be right after work or it could be even very early in the morning, but um, certainly welcome while well, we have a few minutes left if you have any questions for us. I'd be curious about, um uh, kind of how those go. Uh, what what would you be doing on the site visits? Um, you know, what, what does it look like? Yep, that's great. I'm going to turn it over to one of the other commissioners and see if someone would like to kind of outline what a typical site walk is like. You do have to unmute though. I'll give you my take first, Mike and Steve. I mean, uh, the function of a site walk first and foremost is that um, we're we're getting a sense of how things fit together in the field versus on a plane. Um, you can imagine we're often looking at things like 
Um, where, where are the wetland lines? How does water flow? How do, how do other structures uh, uh, impact the, the project? Where is the project itself actually gonna be? So it's, it's really trying to reconcile what's on paper versus what's in the field. Um, there's also more technical components. Sometimes we're looking at wetland delineations. Um, that's where we have, um, thankfully, the, the incomparable expertise of, of Amy Green to help us. Um, Amy's smiling, but it, it's very true. I mean, we're, we rely very much on her expertise to set some of the lines and, and understand where the boundaries are because so much of what we do is defined first and foremost by the proximity to the wetland boundary, you can imagine there's often a lot of discussion about where that boundary actually is. And that's determined based on soil types, that's based on hydrology, that's based on vegetation. Um, and, and we rely a lot on her expertise. Although it's stuff that you'll pick up over time, um, maybe not quite to, to Amy's level, but to, it, it, there's a steep learning curve, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's very doable. I don't know, how do I do this? Really aspire. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, uh, can I add to that real quick, sir? It's Kyle. Oh, yeah, Kyle. I forgot what you were doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, Thank you, um, Kyle. Yeah, no, I, I think what, what Chase said um, is exactly what I try to take from those site walks to site meetings. <clears throat> I'll take it a little bit further. It really gives the applicant or the applicant's engineer or representative a good opportunity to to really show us what they have in mind. Cause like Chase said, the paper's paper. I'm a visual guy. Um, you know, I like to see printed out stuff as it is instead of on a computer screen. So I'd like to take it a step further and be out in the field and they can walk us through, you know, step-by-step step, walk the lines um, and just really give us a better idea. Some, some of these sites that we've been to, you're, you're like, oh, there's no way this is going to work. And you get out there and you give them a chance to explain themselves and vice versa. Um, so it's all about visualization and getting your eyes on the property for me, because every property is different, uh, regardless of, of what the uh, intended scope of work is. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we're going to try and keep on time, and unless Michael or Steve, if you have any other questions. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you both for joining us this evening. So we're going to go ahead and start with our official portion of the meeting, the 7 a.m., uh, 7 p.m., which includes the approval of the minutes from March 22nd. Do we have any? Um, are, you, are you speaking tonight? So, Amy, let, let's go back. And so if anyone has any questions or comments on the minutes. I got Kyle's input. Yeah, I sent uh, a couple things to Amy. I think the only thing of significance, I, and maybe to confirm with us, is um, Amy, you might have it in front of you. It was the count. It was at the Girl Scout troop. We um, we supported the the Girl Scout work that was going to happen at Cloverdale. I think it just had the count wrong, of five to zero instead of six to zero. Okay. Yep. Do we have a motion? Do we have any other um, amendments? If not, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes, uh, Conservation Commission minutes of March 22nd, 2022. Second. 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 Roll call. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Roll call, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kyle. Kyle Maxfield, aye. Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Chase. Chase Kirby, aye. Brian. Brian Crowley, aye. Myself, I, it's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add for administrative discussions for this evening? Okay, we'll carry on through that. Um, Amy, we've tabled the 166 mill information discussion. Yes, although I know Bartlett Harvey's here, so I don't know if you want to hear anything or just oh, table we'll, it. We'll come back to it. I believe that was tabled. Um, project update and run line change, Mass DEP 204-0944, Littleton uh, Water Department, new water supply off Taylor Street. Um, I put this up front just so it could happen anytime because I wasn't sure when the water department would, would show up. Um, I don't know, Corey, if you guys have any updates on that part of it. I think you're just waiting for the natural heritage. Yeah, that's fine. I'll let... Um... Mel or Erica speak to that. They've been in contact with Natural Heritage. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, Eric, I didn't know if you wanted to start off or do you want me to just go ahead and uh, take it away about... You know what, you can give that update and then if anything else comes up, we can go from there. Absolutely. So you're right, we submitted um, last week an updated letter to more formally um, request the red line edit. So you folks should have that. Um, And we have been in contact with uh, Natural Heritage, Dave Paulson there. Um, He didn't seem overly concerned, um, but what he did request was a turtle, an updated turtle protection plan. We weren't going to piggyback off of the Amazon one, which we're thinking maybe we would before. Um, So we have um, enlisted LEC Environmental to create a total protection plan for us. So he knows Dave Paulson uh, very well. So they've been communicating back and forth. Um, I believe he visited the site and he's putting in the total protection plan has been submitted to Dave Paulson at Fish and Wildlife. And we're hoping for um, the approval today. We're going to get it tomorrow or the next day. So I think um, one of the things that Dave Paulson at Fish and Wildlife did say was that um, he'd like to see this um, work done before May 15th, if that's possible. Um, I know that uh, the conservation was hoping to have official um, MISA approval tonight. So I guess my hope is that maybe we could get a conditional approval tonight, um, something that would approve the project, but work couldn't begin until you have the official MISA approval in hand, as well as we would supply you with the turtle protection plan. Um, So that's where we stand right now with MISA. Um, I'm just hoping any day now we should um, get the response. Dave Paulson said it'd be a very quick review on his end. Okay. Amy, do you have thoughts on that for a conditional approval? Um, I would say, especially since this is pretty much a red line change, it seems appropriate. They, they can't get started until Natural Heritage gives their blessing anyway. So okay. if the commission's willing to vote tonight with that condition to approve the red line change, I, I think that's fine. Um, and probably also to make sure they let me know when that is up so it can be inspected. Okay. Is there anything else that would uh, that needs to be added to this discussion before a vote? Okay. If not, feedback from the commissioners in support. If, if we are in support, if someone would like to make a motion with a conditional approval. Or, or denial. Sorry, I'm trying to find an accidental close up. There we go. <clears throat> uh, I move to issue a conditional approval for Mass DEP file number 2040944, uh, contingent upon natural heritage approval of the project. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, roll call vote. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Chase? Chase Carvig, aye. Brian? Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle? Kyle Maxwell, aye. And I'm going to recuse myself. I do have a family member that uh, currently works for the Water Department, and I haven't had a chance to uh, review uh, with the Ethics Commission uh, what I should be doing in this instance. So that'll be one uh, recusation. <laughs> Present. Okay. Thank you. So vote is unanimous. Thank you. Um, next up is a request for a certificate of compliance to, uh, 204-374, located at 114 Taylor Street. Uh, you can tell by the number, this is an old one. They're just trying to clean up the paperwork on their property, and they just never got the certificate of compliance. It was for a new uh, septic system, which received the Board of Health certificate of compliance. So, and it's all stabilized, and I, I think it's ready to go. Okay. With that said, is there a commissioner would like to make a motion? Move to issue a certificate of compliance for last EP file number 204 Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank yep. you, Brian. All right. All those in favor. Uh, Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Chase. Chase Carvig, aye. Brian. Brian Crowley, aye. 
and Kyle. Kyle Maxwell. And myself, I, it's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tree City, USA, select board proclamation. <clears throat> I can't remember if I actually sent that, the actual proclamation around to you, but it's a, a bunch of whereases um, that the select board would actually, I don't know, vote to support Littleton as a, as a tree city. Um, this is something that both the Shade Tree Committee and, and the Highway Department and the Water Department have all been kind of doing very pieces on for Arbor Day. Um, so I was talking to um, Chris Cannon about trying to get that proclamation before Arbor Day, which I believe is the 29th. And that would help set us up to do the Tree City USA application uh, next year, which we didn't quite get in this past year. Do you need us to do anything? Just a vote of support. Okay. If you're so inclined. Anyone so inclined to make a motion? Have, have we seen that? Not that I think there's anything wrong with it. Have, has that gone out? And if it has, I haven't looked at it. And I, I, I probably I, wouldn't vote on it. I, I may have forgotten to, to attach it. It's almost a full page of whereas is about... I don't know, Tree City USA was established in Nebraska in 1954 or whatever it was, and the value of trees. And there's even something there about how happy trees make you and Littleton supports trees. It's pretty nebulous. Okay. Sounds accurate, though. Uh, okay, as long as you're telling me there's no, uh, there's no scary things. And it's, it's boilerplate. It's boilerplate from the Arbor Day Foundation folks. Okay. And I'm good with it. So good. You want to make a motion? Uh, sure. Why not? Uh, I move for the Conservation Commission to support the Select Board Proclamation regarding the Tree City USA designation. Second. All right. Uh, roll call vote. Kyle. Oh, um, Max, you're Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Chase. Brian Crowley, I and myself, I. It's unanimous. Thank you, uh, Amy Williams. Conservation restriction. Uh, can I recommend, for the sake of time, you push that to the end because it might take a little bit of discussion. Yep. Um, I wasn't sure how the beginning of this meeting was going to go, so I piled everything at seven o'clock. Yep, perfect. Um, so we can okay. fill that later. Yep, we'll jump right in to a continued public hearing. Slated for seven o'clock, notice of intent 45 Mattawanakee Trail, uh, Mass DEP 204-955, provision of immersion control, including wall repair, drainage beds, and stairs. Is there someone here to speak to that? Yes, yes. Uh, Mark Hoffman, representing 45 Mattawanakee Trail. Uh, I'm glad to be back. Uh, thank everybody for having me yet again. Uh, since the last time we were here, we received the number from the Mass DEP, and that's kind of where things stand right now. So it's the same story. It was the last two times I was here, so I'm not sure okay. what more you would like me to add. And we'd be more than more than happy to add more if you think that should be would be helpful. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Amy, is there anything else we're seeking? Yeah, no. DEP did issue that with um, the main comment being whether or not the work would need a chapter 91 license for the undercut bank. Um, but that is above uh, the mean high. And I know Mr. Barr, the, the uh, neighbor also did similar work without having to get a chapter 91. So okay. I, I think that's fine. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? I will move that we close the public hearing and uh, issue an order of conditions for Mass DEP file number 204-0955. A second. And is that with um, a waiver as well? Yes. Yes, yes with, uh, with a waiver. Second. Uh, roll call vote. Kyle. Oh, Max, with I. Sarah. Sarah Stewart, I. Chase? Chase Brian? Uh, Brian Crowley, aye. And myself, aye. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the reminder of the waiver with the inclusion of the language as well. Thank you. Um, good luck, Mr. Hoffman. Please keep in touch. 
Yeah, good luck. Thank you. I'm going to hang around for Mr. and Mrs. Barr's uh, presentation. Okay. All righty. So now we are, um, Amy, we're at the 7.15? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the other 7 o'clock was just withdrawal, formal withdrawal of the RDA that you all voted would need a notice of intent. So no vote needed that. It's just I wanted to get it on paper. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so public hearing notice of intent 93 Matawanaki, 59 Matawanaki, and 49. So 90, 93, 59, 49, and one chipmunk with a non determined mass DEP installation of mats for aquatic plant control. Someone here to speak to that? Yep. If you could introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my name's David Barr. I'm one of the applicants, and I'm the president of Friends of Forge Pond, which is a representative for the Notice of Intent. Uh, other applicants here tonight are, I include uh, my wife, Patty, uh, Steve uh, Haddon, um, <clears throat> and uh, Michael Livingston that you uh, talked to before. Um, also attending is, uh, with us is Bob Hartzell, who is a certified lake manager and former, uh, member, board member of the Friends of Forge Pond. Uh, also, uh, Michael Broderick and Jeff Sacknewitz are listening in. They are, uh, participants in the, uh, pilot project in Westford. So, um, the, they are applicants, uh, to the Westford, uh, Conservation Commission for this project. Um, would you like me to give a couple minute introduction? I, I think if you would like to do an introduction to the project and if you have any slides or anything that you'd like to share with the commission, that would be appreciated. I don't have any slides. I just have a, like a two or three minute introduction. Perfect. Okay. Um, the applicants together with the Friends of Forge Pond uh, proposed to investigate the use of benthic bats in, uh, in limited areas in a few waterfronts on Lake Matawanaki to uh, minimize the growth of aquatic plants in uh, these areas to allow for uh, recreation use. Um, the growth of invasive and other aquatic plants in Lake Matawanaki, also known as Forge Pond, is an issue in some parts of the lake. For some of the lake shore residents, the plants pose a pretty considerable nuisance for activities like swimming and boating. Uh, the Friends of Forge Pond has considered several minute methods over the years to manage invasive and nuisance plants in the lake. These include winter drawdowns of the lake levels, um, physical removal of the plants by both uh, manual and mechanical means, uh, and chemical herbicide treatments. Chemical treatments have adverse environmental consequences and they're expensive. Economically and environmentally, Friends of Forge Pond believes that avoiding chemical treatments is advisable. Um, Friends of Forge Pond has been conducting winter drawdowns of the lake for about 10 years in an attempt to manage invasive plant growth in the shallow areas uh, near the shore and provide safe and clean swimming and boating areas in those areas. The drawdowns have been modestly uh, successful in achieving that goal, but goal, but part, uh, but, but, but parts of the lake uh, continue to have uh, plant growth uh, that is an issue. Um, presently, some lakefront residents use hydro raking as an option for eliminating aquatic plants uh, along their shoreline. Um, hydro raking can be successful in removing plants for part of the season, but Hydro raking leaves behind a considerable amount of broken plant fragments that float to other locations in the lake. Uh, these plant masses often foul the water fronts of other residents. Um, as even more of a problem though, these fragments can repopulate in the areas that they migrate to and create new locations of significant plant growth. So uh, what we're proposing here is to try to use benthic mats at seven locations on the lake, four in uh, Littleton and three in Westford, uh, to see if this is a practical way to provide limited 
waterfront areas that are relatively free of dense plant, plant growth for swimming and, and boat access. Uh, benthic mats can be an effective non-chemical means to control nuisance plants in near shore recreation areas. Um, a benthic mat is a physical barrier like a tarp that's placed on a limited area on the lake bottom to prevent uh, plant growth and also provide uh, it prevents plant growth by uh, blocking light that's required for the growth and also um, it creates a, a physical barrier to the growth. So uh, finally potentially the, this pilot project with benthic mats could lead to another option for managing plant growth along the waterfronts on the lake which is simple, low cost, and uh, environmentally friendly. Um, so we're very interested in working with you and with the Westford Conservation Commission to see um, if uh, how well something like this works. Thank you. I just have two questions. Would they be removed at the end of the season? And how do you propose to secure them to the bed of the lake? Yeah, so there are uh, quite a few ways to do benthic mats. Um, we uh, went through uh, s some of that in the in, in our notice of intent. Um, uh, we um, are um, leaving it to the individual participants to decide which type of method they would like to use to to do this um, you know uh, the idea is I mean I don't know that we'll get a lot of different ways some people we, we may all end up doing the same thing but ideally if we get uh, different kinds of things that are tried uh, then we can see oh this one didn't work so well this one worked great or this one worked fine in this kind of conditions but uh, something else worked better in this kind of conditions like you know very deep or you know uh, uh, shallow with uh, more of a wake uh, uh, action from the boats that kind of thing um, so the, um, <clears throat> the, the 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 benthic mats could be either uh, impermeable like a plastic tarp or a nylon tarp, something like that. Or they could be, uh, could be permeable like uh, landscape cloth or uh, burlap uh, cloth. Uh, and the things that are, uh, and, and also they could be uh, biodegradable or not. Um, anything that's not biodegradable, uh, we identified that those would be removed at the end of the season. Um, and in, in addition, any um, <clears throat> non-natural uh, items that are holding it down, like uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, a, <clears throat> a metal uh, weight that might be holding it down, or a stake, metal stake, or something like that. Um, those would also be removed. Uh, if a um, if a benthic mat that somebody's using is biodegradable, like uh, burlap. Uh, cloth, then um, it, uh, as we're proposing, it it could be left in, um, and um, just to simplify things. Uh, but uh, what happens in that case is that uh, the, the 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 mat gets covered with uh, other sediment and uh, over a little bit of time. I don't think a lot of time. Uh, Plants begin to grow on it again, and it just decomposes and becomes part of the part of the lake bed, and it stops acting like a benthic mat. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the, the 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 materials that are uh, not biodegradable, we're uh, saying, would be removed at the end of the season. The proposal was October first, and similarly, uh, materials that are used to hold these things down that are not uh, natural would be removed. Um, you, I think, did you ask how they'd be held down? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. So it could be stakes, it could be weights, um, uh, so, uh, it could be, and the weights could be something like a sandbag, could be rocks, could be um, metal weights. Um, it, uh, the, 
there's one product that one of the participants would be hoping to use, which has uh, uh, long pockets sewn into the to the cloth, uh, where um, uh, reinforcing rods, concrete reinforcing rod is is slid in to to hold the thing down. Um, uh, benthic mats that are permeable uh, would let gases out, and um, they don't tend to bellow up. Um, benthic mats that are not permeable. Uh, tend to have gases that collect underneath them and they need to have holes in them to um, depend if they're if uh, either have holes in them to let the gas out or be narrow enough that the gas can make it to the side of the um, of the tarp and or the mat and, and escape. Thank you. I'll turn this over to the commission to see if individual commissioners would like to ask questions about the mats. Mr. Bart, can, can you describe what we know or don't know about how these mats impact benthic macroinvertebrates, mussels, and, and the like? Um. So we don't have much of that um, in the lake, um, but uh, for the most part, things that are under the mat um, would, uh, unless it's near the edge, uh, would probably uh, be uh, be dying. Um, the the plants that are under the mat. Um, die and when the plant is or when the mats are removed they would start to grow again um, uh, mussels and uh, clams and such that are underneath uh, to the extent that they can't get out from underneath it would probably um, be killed um, but like I said there aren't many of those uh, I mean uh, I see some shells periodically uh, along the shore from um, raccoons that uh, have eaten them, but pretty rarely. Um, and these are uh, rather small. I mean, we're talking, we're suggesting 600 square feet per site. Um, and the total area of all seven of the sites uh, amounts to about one twentieth of one percent of the lake area, the lake bed area. So um, it would make a significant impact in that in that six hundred square feet, but uh, that's a, a very small part of the lake. And like okay. I said, uh, the once once they're removed, the plants would would grow back. Uh, but um, any anim any clams that have died wouldn't. Dave, if I could um, also add though, uh, hydro raking removes an extraordinary number of those invertebrates uh, and that across the whole um, margin of the property. So I'm not necessarily saying that one is better than the other, but uh, you know, the, the practice of hydro raking uh, has a significant impact also. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that, if I might. Uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts commissioned a report. I'm sorry, could, could people identify themselves when they talk with your address? I'm sorry. I'm Steve Haddon. I live at 59 Mattawanagi Trail. I'm one of the sites uh, listed in the notice of intent. Uh, I live right on the lake. So Massachusetts commissioned a report, uh, and it was updated several times. I think the most recent one is 2004, if I remember correctly. It's long, it's all about lake management. It covers many things. Several pages are devoted to the benthic mat. And they describe that uh, to the degree that uh, shellfish and non, uh, I can't remember the word for not having a spine, creatures live under the mat to the degree that they're mobile, which most of them are a little bit, they tend to migrate out from under the mat. Uh, but the ones that don't will die. On the plus side, the mat creates a new boundary area where there's clear water next to water with the plants growing in it. And boundary areas like that are used by various species of fish 
as part of the mating process and uh, as part of their own hunting and uh, feeding and so on. So it contributes to the marine life in that way. Uh, and that kind of offsets the degree to which it compromises the marine life under the mat. Yeah, one other thing is that, I mean, I have read in that, you know, in, in those same state documents that uh, <laughs> for the uh, for the impermeable uh, barriers, the slime that develops on it can attract snails. So that can be a, <laughs> a plus there. <laughs> Um, Amy, do we need an opinion from Natural Heritage on this, given that it, essentially I want to make sure we're not <laughs> inadvertently uh, approving a take of some uh, protected species or something? So this is outside, this is not within a an area that's identified by Natural Heritage as being a protected species area. Yeah, it, it's not, and I'm going to be very curious to see what DEP's comments come back as, which they haven't done yet. Um, I've also been talking to, and I'm going to forget his name, the the agent. Matt over Salem. In, yeah, Matt Salem over in Westford, um, who is very familiar with lake management. Um, so I was sort of hoping Westford would, would go a little first on some <laughs> of this this piece. But it is in, in the generic EIR that the state did. As I think Steve mentioned, um, it's a little bit old now, but it it goes through all the <coughs> different treatment types, including the benthic mats as, as an appropriate methodology. So the commission really does decide if it's an acceptable impact and maybe more to the point how it is monitored and maintained. If you know. Can I ask a, a point of, of reference where we have one DEP number, but yet we have four separate applications no, it's one application for participants. Right. Uh, right. But you referenced, sir, that people would choose their form of mat, how they secure them. So we're not going to have the same product or mechanism for each of the four. Um, from a procedural standpoint, I'm curious how we manage that, Amy, if, if that can be the case, if we have four potentially different clients under one DEP number. Yeah, and 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 that is where, uh, if this goes ahead, writing the order conditions is going to be interesting and, and setting up the, the standards and procedures. Um, my assumption at this point is that an order conditions would be recorded on each of the four properties in Littleton. Um, and I assume Westford's doing the same thing. So that there will be an order conditions on those properties and they would need eventually a certificate of compliance or an extension permit or, or something along those lines. Um, just to what the, to the extent that it's admissible, um, I did talk to Matt today and he has uh, the number from, uh, is it DEP? Um, and he said that there was uh, very little that they really no comments to speak of uh, in in their response. Along those lines, two additional questions. Uh, did, did the applicant's property lines actually reach out into the lake and cover land underwater? No, they end at the water. The the. Um, the state owns the area under the lake. So, the, so whose deed is this getting recorded on? Uh, I was going to record it on the property owner or, or, or on the adjacent property owner, the applicants, not on the state, because it's, it's got to go with the land, with the person who's responsible for maintaining these, such as, as they would for a dock. But if some get removed and some don't get removed, if some are organic and some are not, I, I find it challenging to understand how we're going to have everyone follow the same guidelines, same well, expectations. So at the end of the year, Amy's going to have to look, okay, who was supposed to pull their mats out? Who's leaving their mats in? Who's going to verify that they didn't float away or haven't, haven't moved as well? I just... um. Go ahead. So, um, 
once we get our orders and conditions, um, they will stand for three years, I, I believe, uh, and they could be renewed. Um, and uh, the order of conditions, I assume, would be written in such a way that, uh, you know, it could be this or this or this or this, and any one of them would be acceptable. And um, that um, <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> you know, as, as long as the participants are following the different uh, regimens laid out in the orders of conditions, which, um, you know, like I said, uh, would allow for multiple different ways of doing it, um, then uh, they'd be uh, following the, the, the guidelines. So, Amy, you'd be potentially looking at four certificates of compliance or one? Four. Probably four partials, I guess. Okay. I'd like to I mean, ask uh, if there are any other commissioners that have comments on this and how they'd like to proceed, because we have a full docket tonight. I've got about five more, Sarah, but I'll, I'll yeah, I, sit back until others have questions. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Kyle, you want to go ahead and ask some of your questions? Yeah, I think mine are, I think mine are easy. Um, <clears throat> Can you just describe so the installation process? I get you're well, it's not super clear yet, to be honest. But um, at the location these are going to be installed, what type, what depth of water are we looking at, and who are you, the applicants, actually installing these, or do these need to be installed by you know an approved vendor of some sort? Uh, they can be installed by anybody that's up to it. Um, in uh, the uh, ways that they're installed depend on what kind of conditions are at the site. Uh, some of the sites are rather deep, you know, eight, nine feet deep, and those would uh, require, you know, uh, snorkeling or possibly, you know, scuba, uh, or uh, using a system which is designed to be played out uh, in such a way that it could be you know, uh, released from the surface and then uh, falls down uh, to the to the lake bottom, um, and uh, either of those are 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 possible, um, uh, and have been described in in the um, both in in the the state documents and in uh, commercial um, uh, recommendations for you know companies that. Uh, provide these kinds of things, uh, and uh, in places where it's it's shallower, some places it would only be a, a few feet deep, and all you'd have to do is walk out and pull it out, and you know, put some rocks on it or sandbags or something like that. So it depends on what the what the location's like, but it would basically be done manually. Uh, generally, generally it would be done by the participants or, you know, several helping each other. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Barr, I'd be concerned with um, aquatic animals, turtles, frogs, et cetera, being trapped or otherwise ensnared in, um, in these mats. Um, it sounds like you have a number of different construction and installation options um, available to you. I just would hope that, um, you know, that sort of thing would be considered as uh, as you move forward with this. You know, I, I don't know what the best way um, to proceed would be to, to sort of mitigate that risk, but um, right. I, I'd like you to think about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, the um, uh, uh, Most of the mats would be uh, held down around the edge and in the middle so that uh, there aren't, really opportunities they, they work best when they are really flush with the, the bottom of the of, of the of, of the lake and so the the weights would be placed around the edges and you know as, as needed in a few places in the middle uh, so that uh, there would be uh, little hopefully opportunity to be getting underneath it uh, some of them would have slits in them if they're impervious and they need to be releasing gases and uh, something could climb in there, um, uh, I guess. Um, in all that I've read about it, I haven't seen that as being um, identified as a, as a as an as an issue. Uh, Bob, do you know any more about that? 
No, I think you've, you've and Bob Hartzell, uh, 24 Deer Run Road. Um, no, I think you've characterized it correctly. Uh, the only thing I would add, I guess, to the previous discussion about um, mussels and other invertebrates is that you're talking about, you know, if you're talking about a maximum 600 square foot area, the shape and configuration will vary from lot to lot, but you're talking, you know, 20 feet by 30 feet or, or something like that, you know, 10 feet by 60 feet. Um, the muscles in particular you know, do move and they will, if they are on the margins, say, you know, within 10, 15 feet of the margin, they can easily work their way out. And um, that, that distance and that pace of movement is consistent with, you know, the considerations that are given for things like drawdown when you do the, the lake level um, drop at a gradual pace so that these organisms can move with the water and not be overwintering in an area that's exposed to freezing. So it's not like that once they're covered under the mat that they're gonna be immobile and completely unable to find you know, refuge outside of the mat. Um, I, I really, and like Dave said, I just reiterate, I don't think there's anything in the literature that really talks about um, their reptiles, you know, turtles and so on, getting under the mat after installation. So I wouldn't really think that that's much of a concern. We, and my, my concern bringing up the muscles was not, uh, not so much specific to the loss of some muscles as long as they're populous enough. I just wanted to make sure that we were not going to be doing harm to a uh, more sensitive population, uh, subpopulation. Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little more specifically. So having done uh, you know several muscle surveys in the lake during my time living here over the last eight Teen or so years, um, I can tell you that the only freshwater mussel that we found has been the eastern elliptio, which uh, is not in any way rare. It's, it's by far the most common mussel uh, in you know the United States, for that matter, but certainly in Massachusetts, uh, it's it's really abundant. So, uh, if there was a little bit of loss on the margins as, as a result of the mats, um, it certainly wouldn't you know extirpate them from the lake and um, you know, they, they certainly exist also in Beaver Brook Corridor, so they'd be able to, you know, work their way back in. So um, that's, I guess, the best answer I can give you on that. No, that, that's a reasonable answer, and I think so, as far as my concern specific to the micro and bird Okay, um, Sarah, do you mind if I ask a couple more questions? I know we're pushing on time. But, yep. uh, no, feel free. I, I feel as though the discussion is necessary. Um, Mr. Barr or, or other applicants, this has been characterized as a pilot program. Help me understand what you mean there and what, is, what does this mean long-term versus short-term? So um, our, our thought is to first understand, uh, we don't have any experience uh, actually using this. We've read a lot about it and understand the potential for it. Um, <clears throat> we would like to see how successful it is on the lake, especially as an alternative to hydro raking, which has its own set of problems, significant problems. Um, so we thought we would start with a, a few, you know, small number, half a dozen or so sites to see what our experience is and whether it's uh, something that really is uh, potentially useful on the lake. Um, if it is, then um, uh, I would like to see, we would like to see, if it's possible to uh, set up some uh, process, maybe some umbrella uh, uh, um, uh, notice of intent and, and orders of conditions that would allow this kind of uh, process to be done by uh, Lakes residents uh, under certain conditions, following certain guidelines, uh, where they wouldn't necessarily, uh, where those are all set out ahead of time by the by the commission, and uh, the, app, the the people that want to do this wouldn't necessarily have to come and do their own notice of intent every time uh, to to do this. Uh, if if we and and maybe we need several cycles to get enough. Uh, experience and confidence in it, um, but uh, our hope is that if it does look like it's useful, then uh, hopefully we could find some way in working with uh, you and with the Westbury Conservation Commission to have something sort of umbrella process that 
um, would allow people to, to use it um, in a way that doesn't require them to, you know, spend $700 and spend, you know, uh, uh, a lot of time to, to put together um, uh, proposals. Um, I don't know if that's possible. We don't even know if it's, you know, if it's going to be as useful as it seems to be, but that's sort of the reason we're calling it a pilot project um, rather than just a, you know, uh, an application for for doing the doing the mats. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else, we have to wind this conversation down. Um, Chase, do you have, or anyone else have one last question? Um, well, I, I have a couple comments then, um, and I'll, I'll leave them at that. Um, one, if it's going to be a pilot project, I'm, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with the um, ad hoc nature of choosing the materials. I, I don't, I, I question the value of a pro pilot project when we don't really know what it is we're going to be testing. Um, if the goal is to look for materials that are going to work well. So I, I think specificity in materials is something that I'd like to understand a, a bit better. Another concern I have is the inspection frequency. In other words, again, if this is a pilot program, how are we gonna know that these things are working? I'm also really concerned with um, installation methods, some of these things disappearing, particularly impermeable options and billowing and disappearing and, and um, you know, floating away or, or otherwise ending up on the other side of the lake. And then um, the materials, I'm acutely concerned with the proposal to um, lack of specificity in materials. I'm, I guess I'm not at all comfortable with some of the materials specified for um, holding down the mats or even the types of mats, including a whole bunch of, um, a whole bunch of um, degradable materials, for example, sandbags. Like it, it, there's no specificity. What I would not at all want to see is a sandbag made of um, what's the like uh, plastic mesh material. That would be terrible. Uh, same with PVC pipes, steel reinforcing bars. That's just garbage. Uh, and and I, I don't believe for a second that all of that would get pulled back out. Um, last piece is I'm concerned about um, use of biodegradable. Um, biodegradable oftentimes means on long time scales and um, under ideal conditions. And I'm modestly confident that if we were to use burlap, the, the net result would be we'd find scraps of burlap all over the place for the next two or three years. So uh, therein are my concerns. Um, if we can probably talk this to death, but uh, I would like to see some more specificity in, in the approach. So just to respond, so if, if I may, if I may, sir. So I think you, we've had quite a bit of discussion tonight. So I think um, what we usually ask applicants is to kind of have a recap of your four sites, kind of think of the criteria and the comments that we've given. We're happy to move this forward to continue discussion on our next meeting, um, which is in a few weeks if you would like, but I, I think um, the way that this process works, if you were to ask us to vote on this this evening, I don't believe that we have enough information. Um, so if you have a, a last question, I, we can take that, but we do need to keep going on to other meetings this evening. Yeah, no, I understand that you wouldn't be voting tonight. Um, just to respond briefly to, to one thing and then to mention one thing to Amy possibly to think about. Um, so uh, I, I understand, uh, you know, your concerns, Chase, about things being unspecified, but um, uh, I would say that we could be very specific about the kinds of things, the, the, the ways that it could be done, uh, and then people can choose, you know, if we've got four or three or six different uh, specific methods and materials that could be used uh, that are okay, uh, then people can choose to use one of those, uh, but they would have to... You know, if we want to be very specific, I mean, uh, we, we we mentioned uh, them in the notice of intent, but we could be very specific in the order of conditions about which things are allowed, and then people would need to use one of those ways. Um, and uh, the last thing is that, uh, Amy, I would ask to think about uh, possibly having this as one, uh, uh, you know, uh, registration and one uh, uh, <clears throat> certificate of compliance. Uh, we are uh, had in our proposal had offered to um, uh, prepare, keep track of what's happening at each site each season, uh, and 
record that and report it back to to you and uh, keep track of so, so that we have a, a an understanding of what happened during during this and if you want we could also be uh, partner with you in making sure that uh, conditions of such as if if we don't want the burlap to be left in there that could that we, we could say every year all of that has to come out that would be fine if you want we could work with you to you know work with the participants to make sure those things happen okay okay thank you i think it's better I, I, would, I would i would sarah if 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 i can um i may need to check with town council about how all this gets recorded uh, on i agree and, all that stuff. and yeah. Yeah. Similar to, I will not design a stormwater basin. I can't design what your alternatives are going to be. That's going to have to be you guys coming mm -hmm. up with something. Right. So okay. I think just to recap, we've, you know, it's a fascinating conversation. I think we're all looking for alternatives. Um, I wish we had an hour to go through, but I think we've had good, meaningful discussion tonight. It has certainly, I think you can tell, it's raised a few red flags um, just from procedural standpoint. But um, we will have to excuse to go on to another hearing, which is slated for 7.30 this evening. Okay. Sure. Th thank, thank you very much. much. Appreciate your time. Okay. So we're going to open the 7.30. It is now 7.48 public hearing notice of intent, 242 King Street, Littleton Water Department, phase 1A of the extension project. Um, who's here to speak with us this evening? Corey Hi. This is, yeah, this is Corey Godfrey from the Water Department. I'm here... Um, with Kara Johnston and Maggie Lofsted from CDM and Smith. Diane, They're the um, engineering firm. Um, oh, and Diane, sorry, um, from CDM Smith as well. They're the engineering firm designing the Littleton Common sewer system for the town. Um, I believe you've met all of them previously during the ANRAD process, which I'm glad we went through, not only to um, confirm the wetland resource boundaries, but it also provided an opportunity for several of the commission members to walk the site, which I think will provide some context um, for the conversation tonight. Um, so I'm going to leave it primarily to the folks from CDM to give a brief presentation and then, you know, obviously answer any questions that the commission has. Oh, and Sarah, before we uh, jump into things, for reasons yeah, stated no. before, I'm just going to recuse myself from the yeah. hearing. Thank you for reiterating that. Okay, great. If you could, uh, if we could carry on. Okay. Uh, thanks, Corey. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Um, can everyone see that okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks again for having us um, here tonight to speak about the Littleton uh, Sewer System Expansion Project and new treatment facility at 242 King Street. As Corey mentioned, my name is Kara Johnson. I'm the project manager for the project. And with us tonight is Maggie Lofsett, our wetland scientist, and Diane Valardosha, our stormwater designer. So, um, sorry. There we go. Um, so tonight, uh, we'll give a, a quick project overview. We just wanted to remind the group um, and set the stage in terms of how we got here. Um, so CDM Smith has been working with the water department. This is their current existing sewer system as it stands today. Um, so right now there's a small package treatment facility located at the high school that treats just a few municipal buildings. Um, so there is a limited capacity at that treatment facility and that is what has ultimately triggered this overall project uh, with the desire for the town to expand the system uh, and be able to treat more wastewater. Um, so with that, we worked with the water department to do a town-wide needs assessment, um, looked at all sorts of factors from water quality environment to zoning and economics. All of those different concerns were ranked, and ultimately a recommended plan was developed um, as we're here tonight to speak to. So in case anyone wanted to read through, the full report is available on the water department's website, um, but we did just want to remind folks of that. So that recommended plan did have a lot of input from different stakeholders in town, uh, including the Conservation Commission and other environmental groups. Uh, and ultimately the recommendation was to expand the sewer system and particular areas and to construct a centralized treatment facility at 242 King Street that we'll speak to tonight. So over that time period, the Water Department did purchase the site um, as many of you are familiar and have visited so far. 
So the phase 1A project that we're here tonight for um, is for the plant that's located right here at 242 King Street. So right on the intersection, if you will, of King Street and 495. The project also includes an effluent recharge facility that's outside of the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction located up at the high school, but we did want to point that out. The new wastewater collection system will include a combination of gravity sewer, pressure sewer, forest main, and pumping stations. So to walk through a little bit how that layout will work, the red lines that you see here are gravity pipes. Um, so this is primarily focused in the common area. So gravity pipe will collect wastewater from the properties adjacent to this line. We have a couple of different pump stations in the system as well. So near the common area, there is a pumping station located at Great Road. And we'll go through um, the pumping stations on a future slide. Um, but the Great Road is outside of the jurisdiction. From there, the wastewater would flow to the existing middle school pump station that's being upgraded as part of this project. Um, so the, the majority of the station is staying as it exists today with some small upgrades to the facility. Um, and from there, the flow from this side of 495 would be pumped from the middle school to the new plant. Um, there is consideration for sewer along Russell Street as well, but that would also be flowing right to the plant. Um, and then on the other side of the highway, um, as I mentioned, the um, treatment facility uh, located at the high school would eventually be decommissioned and a new pumping station is included as part of this project to pump the flow from the high school to the new treatment facility. Uh, once the facility is online and running, that clean effluent water would be pumped back up to the high school and be recharged below the fields there. So that's the overall um, big picture of the, of the phase that we're talking about. The plant itself is going to be constructed with an initial capacity of just over 200,000 gallons per day. Um, that is what the groundwater discharge permit application that was submitted to MassDEP is uh, for, for that effluent recharge site. So that initial capacity matches that. Um, certain components are, are making sure that any future expansion up to 290,000 gallons per day can be accommodated. The system will be a MBR, a main bioreactor treatment system. Um, the site itself is adjacent to Beaver Brook, just around nine acres. And we'll go through the specifics of the floodplain and riverfront tonight. So the layout of the facility that was submitted as part of our NOI includes a new 24 foot wide access road right off of King Street. Um, the pipes coming into the line will be coming from the high school and the middle school pumping station. So we'll have two forest mains coming into the site. Those would enter into what we're calling the influent equalization tank. Those would end up being pumped to a screening room, um, to the biological tanks, and ultimately into the membrane process building. And then from there, there is an effluent pumping station that would pump the clean effluent back up to the high school. So um, the mo most of this, most of the components of the facility are below grade. The tanks are below grade. The above grade portion that you would see is the process building, which is around 75 feet by 64 feet right now. The um, effluent pumping station is below grade. Uh, you would also see the generator that's located on this side of the building. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Diane, who's gonna walk us through the stormwater design. Thank you, Cara. Um, so the stormwater analysis is based on trying to bring the site into compliance with the Massachusetts stormwater standards. So the, the rainfall analysis was based on NOAA Atlas 14 for the two 10 and 100 year uh, storm events. We also considered the 2070 50 year 24 hour storm as a check of resilience of the site due to, due, due to climate change. The soils are a mixture of A, C and D soils and the tributary area in addition to the plant itself includes a portion of 495 to the south, the southeast access ramp associated with 495 and part of King Street. Those areas discharge um, currently into an existing low-lying area on the site. And when the water in that low-lying area gets to be a certain elevation, it overtops, it goes into to Beaver Brook. And Beaver Brook is considered the design point for the analysis. We used the, that existing loan lying area and retrofitted it to be for peak attenuation for the proposed plant. 
And what we found is that the for the for the 10, uh, 50, and 100 year storms, um, there's full attenuation between existing and proposed conditions. For the two year storm, there's a very minor increase of 0.1 CFS for the two year storm. And that's due to the fact that the, the area between the access driveway and um, the 50 foot no disturb zone is not tributary to any of the, any of the um, infiltration basins or the, the low lying area. And the average um, curve number in that area is higher than the curve number of, of the existing conditions part, and it just generates a little bit of, of flow. We also um, considered looking at the condition during a flood, where which is elevation uh, 211, and assume that the basin itself or that low lying area was full of water, elevation 211, as well as the, the tailwater part. And we also found that flow is fully attenuated for the two 10 and 100 year storms. Next slide, please. So to manage the stormwater, we are proposing three infiltration basins at the site. One is located by the entrance driveway. The other one is um, located by the, the influent area. And the other, last one is located by the, the um, membrane filter building. And they were designed to provide um, recharge volume based on a soil, since most of the site is a soils, as well as the water quality volume of one inch. It's, it's within a, a drinking water um, district. The site also meets minimum control measure number five of the MS4 permit for new development, which is retention of one inch for new development. So in order to um, maintain the current con connectivity between the existing low-lying area and Beaver Brook, because the entrance driveway you know, cuts it off under the proposed conditions, we are proposing to put in a, an embedded six by three foot box culvert, which will allow that um, flow. And it was designed to provide um, at least as much flow as it is today. Under existing conditions, we estimated 64 CFS, and under proposed conditions, it'll be providing 85 CFS. Um, next slide, please. So this um, figure shows where the proposed locations of the infiltration basins are. The, the, the blue stars are the locations of the basins. And um, as I said, they, they provide the entire water quality treatment and recharge volume for the proposed site and before, and then the two basins on, on the left discharge into the existing low lying area and then exit out towards Beaver Brook through the proposed culvert. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Magdalena to uh, talk about permitting. Okay, thank you, Diane. Um, so the, uh, the layout of the site you know, maximized uh, the use of the open field uh, and also preserved the, there's a, a natural swale kind of like at the base of that slope leading up to 495 um, to preserve the sort of natural drainage. Um, so the majority of the impacts to bordering land subject to flooding is from the new access road, uh, which has to be 24 feet wide in order to accommodate a w, uh, B50 tractor trailer um, <clears throat> that comes in and like hauls the sludge um, out from the uh, process building. And uh, there's no parking, it's just a turnaround area that you can see up in the northern part of the site. Um, they we entirely were able to avoid the 50 foot no disturb zone, although we have some uh, impacts to bordering land subject to flooding. Uh, which are being replaced to close to what we're impacting. Um, the wastewater treat, uh, wastewater projects are exempt from the Riverfront Protection Act. Um, the site does contain riverfront area. If you want to go to the next slide. So um, the uh, layout was designed in compliance with the performance standards for work in uh, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, the blue area shown here on this figure is where we're providing the compensatory flood storage. Uh, it is, uh, according to the performance standards, adjacent and contiguous with existing bordering uh, BLSF, and it's in that low-lying area that Diane was talking about earlier. Uh, the net gain is about 832 cubic feet. Um, we have a connectivity uh, to the... Um, Downstream BLSF uh, 
via that six by uh, foot, six foot by three foot embedded box culvert. And we don't anticipate any restriction in flood flow as Diane went over um, during her presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also are in compliance with the local wetlands bylaw um, in, uh, for alteration to the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, which requires that we cannot significantly impair the values and function of adjacent areas uh, subject to protection. And we are preserving the 50 foot no disturb zone. We are, however, having some alterations in the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, we did look at uh, using pervious pavers, but because the, the uh, seasonal high water table is high in that area, uh, it would, uh, require us to raise the driveway in approximately one another uh, 1.4 feet, which would create additional impacts to BLSF. So we um, are not pursuing that option. Um, and um, we were, the, the uh, water department will not use any fertilizer containing nitrogen and phosphorus, which is another requirement under your local bylaw. The uh, uh, water department is requesting a wa waiver, um, which was included in notice of intent. Um, this is a limited project under the Mass Wetlands Protection Act. It is a, obviously public interest, and it's in full compliance with the performance standards. And um, it's the least damaging environmental alternative, and we had a discussion in notice of intent about that. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, this table just summarized was included in the application as well that there are some temporary alterations to uh, the resource areas, 100 foot buffer and the 50 foot no disturb zone as part of the installation of the new collection systems, the force mains and gravity sewers that um, Kara mentioned in her uh, part of the presentation. And these are temporary and they uh, will be just restored uh, in kind, um, restored to pre-construction grades and conditions with no net loss in uh, any resource area. And also all of the uh, collection system will be in, installed in existing paved streets or parking lots. Um, there is a, a slight permanent alteration within the 100 foot buffer zone at the middle school pump station uh, for the upgrade. And that's Pump station will be upgraded to serve both the phase 1A and the future phase 1B. Um, new submersible pumps and pipe connections um, will be installed for that, for the gravity sewer that's coming into the station and for the force main that's uh, leaving the station, going back to the uh, treatment facility. Um, there will be a larger natural gas generator installed, and um, that is that's the, uh, it requires an expanded concrete pad from what's there currently. And uh, we don't have a, haven't sized it uh, exactly, but it will be no larger than 10 by 10 feet. So that is the only permanent um, alteration for the collection system. So we just want to highlight that. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Kara, um, go over the next steps. Hey, so I, um, just to wrap up, um, we have been going through the NEPA process. Um, so our public comment period for our ENF is through the 22nd of this month and expects the certificate around the 29th. Um, we did have a public hearing held um, two weeks ago for that submittal. Um, so we were working through the NEPA process and then there's a number of other permitting steps that we're working through for the whole project. Um, we are working with MassDOT since much of the collection system work is on the state roads. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with MassDEP through the groundwater discharge permitting process for the effluent site up at the high school. We are also working with Mass Historical and the Littleton Historical Commission um, to coordinate that project at 242 King Street. Um, and then we are also going through special permit and site plan review. Um, but the uh, next steps for the overall project is to have 100% design completed in June uh, with bidding hoping to happen over the summer. Um, and with that, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioners, do you have any questions, comments?
I've got, a, I think, two or three questions. Um, one, and this one is probably for Diane. Um, in the context of the stormwater system, given that we're draining from the highway, how much extra stormwater capacity can we essentially fill in with sedimentation uh, and still meet the, the discharge requirements? I, in, in other words, I expect we're going to get a lot of sand and grit in those stormwater basins adjacent to the highway. Well, well, the the um, the infiltration basins aren't taking any water from Route 495. So the water from Route 495 is to the south. The, 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 the tributary area to it is to the south of, of the project site. So it, it drains actually first into the southeast access ramp area, which is all vegetated. And then there's a 36 inch culvert that goes from that point into our project site. So, you know, so the, some of the uh, material like sedimentation, that sort of thing would, would be taken out through that part. And then within the, the, the existing depression area, we are put, proposing to put in a sediment forebay, which will capture some of the set, which are intended to capture the sediment that's be coming from 242 King Street or from, from King Street, as well as from 495 prior to going into the, um, the, the low lying area that we're using for peak attenuation. So I'm, I may have been mistaken there then in my understanding. So the, the basins on the 242 King Street property, the only water from the highway is coming from the, I guess, western side of, of King Street. There's no direct uh, runoff from the highway to those basins. No, no, there is not. Um, second question is, I, I didn't see on any of your figures but it's also a 300 page packet and maybe not having read every page of it. Um, the underground features, the piping from King Street to the EQ tank, I just wanna make sure the alignment of that is not drastically different than the alignment of the road or um, some other already planned feature. The piping, from the two pumping stations will follow the access drive. It'll follow underneath the access drive? Or yes, primarily there, if, if anything, right along the edge, um, perhaps for the electrical ducting. Well, and I, I guess that's, that's what I was trying to get at. If it's gonna follow along the edge, which edge? Because one of the edges were, were close to the 50 foot buffer. So that's what I was trying to. Yeah, no, we would certainly avoid the 50 foot buffer completely. Um, again, trying to keep everything under the road, but if for any reason they can't fit, it would be right along the opposite edge. And is that going underneath the culvert? Is that an open cul the open bottom box culvert? It, it's not open bottom. Um, it, it's embedded, so it will have a, it's embedded about a foot and a half inch, so it'll have a stone bottom as part of the embedment. <clears throat> Any other commissioners have questions? Yeah, I have another one. Um, I think one of the, we talked in the past, <clears throat> there was going to uh, be a, like a tree survey performed on the property. Is that in process or do we have anything on that? Uh, yes, we did one. Um, it's included in the package. Okay, sorry, I did not get a chance to go through them before. Yeah, and 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 the, all the trees are numbered um, on the plans. So, I'm sorry if I missed that. So, where are we with permitting, and what are you seeking this evening, Amy? Perhaps you can help with that as well, or the applicant. Oh. Uh, well, there's no DEP file number, so you could enclose even if you wanted to. Um, I believe based on the packet, they would still own the commission, the details on the Phragmites control they're planning on doing. Okay. In what they're calling a low-lying area, I'm not sure why you're not calling it a basin because it was determined to be a stormwater feature. Um, and what if any other plantings, um, landscaping restoration the commission wants to see? And 
so I guess you guys are, you do have to go back to the planning board because I, I talked with Marn briefly about this, if there's going to be a third party review on the stormwater, um, which is especially complicated by the fact that this is all happening in floodplain and water's got to come and go both directions at all times. So it seems as though we're going to obviously continue this to the 26th. And I also, I didn't know, I go back and forth, frankly, on the value of this, if the commission wanted a wildlife habitat evaluation for the boarding land subject to flooding impacts. I know it's, what was it, 26,000, whatever square feet, most of which is Phragmites, but if it's over 5,000 square feet in, in the more native vegetation, the commission could ask for a wildlife habitat evaluation or just move right on to sort of the mitigation, naturalization, how are these basins going to look? Are they have any wildlife value? All those pieces. It's a good point. Commissioners, have any thoughts either way on that, please? I, I see nominal value in doing it. Okay. Anyone else? Brian, Kyle, Andrew? It, that does bring up another question, though, and, and maybe this is more directed at Corey than um, CDM. But the the maintenance of those basins, I'm uh, I'm presuming that the planning board will ask for a peer review on the stormwater. I'm somewhat concerned about the infiltration, the long term efficacy of those infiltration basins. Um, do we have an O&M plan in place? Will we have an O&M plan in place before this is approved? And if neither of those are true, maybe Corey, you can talk through what you envision the O&M to look like. Yeah, I don't, Diane, did we include an O&M plan in the, in the submission? I did. There yes. was an O&M plan prepared as part of the submission. Sorry, I, uh, like I said, I admit to having not read all, all of those pieces yet. Yeah. No, that's understandable. 300 pages is quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I would propose that we go ahead and continue this to April 26th and the applicant can review kind of comments and discussion from this evening. And I think it, it may be useful for commissioners to think about if they have any questions, they would want the peer review, the presumed peer review, um, to consider um, outside the normal stuff that they, they do since... Again, this is a little bit unusual site, and I'm thinking particularly the 242 King site. Okay. So with that said, if you have any questions or um, areas that you want influenced, um, send that on to, to Amy this week if you can. Okay, we've got to keep going. So we're going to close this and move on to our 745 continued public hearing, Notice of Intent 22 Porter Road. Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry. One thing, I don't think so. Anyone make sure there's no one in the audience public who has any questions i didn't see any hands up okay all right so, moving on 745 yep thank you thank 22 you. 22 porter road mass dep 204 953 addition to a single family house is there someone here to speak to that yes um good evening i'm russ tetford hancock associates representing john carhonen um i am the project engineer in uh, this project. Uh, so kind of wrap up from what we talked about during our last meeting, uh, the commission wanted to see an updated stormwater memorandum with 25 year and 100 year storms. Um, they wanted a more defined O&M plan. Um, so we revised our stormwater report to also include specific guidance on when inspections should take place. Um, what to do, they observe um, standing water um, longer than a period of 72 hours. Um, and also uh, in terms of uh, frequency of cleaning. And then um, the last issue was we didn't have a DP number, which we have now included now. Um, so the revised stormwater report um, includes those, all, th all those things. Um, included is an inspection log to keep for record. Um, that the, the owner um, should keep um, safekeeping. And then if the commission were to ask, um, he could have provided those records um, for you. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, the commission has reviewed the stormwater report. And if you have any questions on it, uh, 
Happy to answer. I don't have any questions. I appreciate the applicant going through that um, slightly additional, so small additional bit of, of work. Uh, makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Still, still don't love the idea of a, <clears throat> something on a residential property that requires O and M. But uh, it, I think what we've got is about as good as we could hope for here. And then it's upon the, the, the applicant to follow through on. I think any, I can anything else that you wanted to ask of of Mr. Tedford. I, I was I was going to say that in in regard to um, the stormwater system, I can certainly put on the view permit uh, system in town a flag, as some properties have flags that there's a conservation restriction on it. But this could be a flag that there is a stormwater feature that needs ongoing maintenance. And if the commission wants to dig into this a little bit more for future projects about um, deed restrictions or notice, for instance, what the Board of Health does, they have a notice of alternative sewage disposal systems. They require occasionally actual wording in the deed. There's a lot of different levels of doing this. Um, if there's concern that an attorney, and as the attorneys I talked to said, yeah, it's pretty likely, won't actually read these certificate compliance, um, just say, oh, look, they've got one. Um, Sherry Gold suggested a great big stamp on the front of the certificate compliance saying there is a continuing condition here. So they might not even read that. So no matter what you do, it's only as good as the attorney usually who reads the stuff. I do like the idea of a stamp. But the form is really crowded. I was looking for a place I could stamp something without covering up the language. So Do we have an updated plan for this project so we could throw up real quick? I'm trying to remember if this project required a waiver, if I'm remembering correctly. It did not. They moved it. Yeah, okay. they moved it out of the way for us. It was originally up to the line. Amy, I think when we were out there, Hancock was going to get you um, the soil borings for the wetland delineation. Did he send those along? He never did send those along. Okay. You are okay with I'm sorry to get those to you if you're still missing. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd still like to have those included in the in the package. Brian, do you think that's something that is problematic? Like, do you want to wait till you have that, or do you feel comfortable? No, I, I don't think it's problematic. Um, okay. More procedural. Um, you know, okay. something we talked about on the on the site walk, and I uh, want to make sure that they're in there as backup. Okay. So Amy can hold it for a little bit, but not forever. Okay. So going forward, is there someone, if there are not any other questions, is there someone that would like to put forth a motion? And I assume this would uh, include a continuing condition for ongoing O&M of the yep. system. Correct. Uh, I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for 22 Porter Road, DEP file number 204-0953 with the aforementioned conditions. <laughs> we have a second. Second. All right, roll call vote. Uh, let's see, Brian. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle. Oh, Max, you'll aye. Chase. Sarah? Sarah Seward, aye. Myself, aye. It's unanimous. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thank so you. now opening the APM continued public hearing, notice of intent 331 Goldsmith Street. Um, no DEP number given, construction of a garage, and after the fact permitting for fill and grading and buffer zone, subject to enforcement order from August of 2021. Anyone here to speak to this? I don't believe information was given ahead of time to the meeting. Yes, good evening. Uh, Matt Morrow here. Um, Amy, if I could share my screen. Please. Okay, can everybody see this okay? Yes. Okay, good. So um, 
essentially what we have is we went back and re revisited the plan and we revised it um, based on the commission's input from the last meeting. Whereas we now have, um, I had David Ross go in and draw. They now have um, 52 feet of the wall on this side being removed, this section of wall being removed. We have the 50 foot buffer zone right here. Um, in, in brown is the uh, limit of work area. Um, we have grading that would go down from, zoom in on it a little bit here, from the 102 detail down to the 99 contour line, which matches the bottom heading towards the wetland. So what is proposed in the narrative that I sent over to Amy um, to be planted in this section here in the uh, circle would be a variety of um, berry bushes, winterberry, elderberry, um, and high bush blueberry. Uh, along with that is a, um, a seed mix that is a wildlife conservation seed mix. And if you could bear with me for a minute, I will share that table so you can see what the seed mix um, is proposed. Just bear with me for one moment. So what I'm looking at planting in the remainder of the work area is a wildlife conservation seed mix. This is a standard um, seed mix, which is a transitional mix um, heading from the area around the bushes right next to the wetland going up into the work area that was demarcated on the plan. It has a mixture of upland, facultative upland and facultative wetland vegetation. Um, it's an excellent mix. Um, I've used it successfully in other areas. Um, so essentially we'll go back to the, the plan. Again, bear with me for just one moment. I apologize. Never been rapid fire on the uh, screen share. I've asked DEP about a number. I haven't gotten anything from them yet. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, what the holdup is, but I mean, we know that sometimes the numbers can be delayed because of the workload. That's about it. Um, it's a very, I mean, it, there's a lot of work in removing this wall. Uh, the equipment would have to come in and come in this way. Uh, the applicant is also looking to do evergreen plantings, um, which would be like emerald, you know, emerald green or green giant arborvitaes along here. Um, and the applicant has asked me if it would be okay if they could do a few or more of those arborvitaes along here outside of the proposed work area along the house for a privacy buffer. Basically it does. Questions, comments, concerns? Those plantings would have to be put on that plan, proposed plan. Your yeah, I can space them out. That, that's not a problem. So essentially, the way they would be planted is they would be, you know, the, the bushes would be basically five feet apart from the center of the diameter of the plant. Uh, it gives them space to, you know, grow out, flush out without out competing each other. Um, and then the seed mix goes around that it makes a nice complement to it. Commissioners have any questions? So, and just to reiterate that we do not have a DEP number. And, and also don't lose sight of the fact, I, I believe this will also include approval of that proposed addition, which is just barely in the buffer zone. That's this area right here. Yeah. And it's this corner of it that's within the buffer zone. I mean, you know, I know there was some filling and work here. What was here before? Um, if you'd indulge me for just a minute, uh, I'm going to just go to another picture really quick. And uh, pardon my hand waving in the back of the uh, of <laughs> background here. Yeah, 
Here's an aerial from 2013. So what you can see is that even before the alteration, this area here was just actual lawn. So we're actually even, you know, with the, the, the violation that we're correcting, we're taking an area that was formerly manicured lawn and naturalizing it. So I think that's actually a good benefit. Um, you know, the grading would be gentle enough uh, where, you know, the seeding wouldn't wash out. It would make a good vegetative buffer going to that wetland because, you know, the flows do go in this direction. Uh, so I think there's some benefits here that, you know, we've created with this particular plan. Okay. Thank you for sharing that, Ariel. I would move that we would propose to continue this to April 26th. Do any of the commissioners have any other comments for Mr. Morrow? Okay. My only comment, think. Sarah, is that it, I think when it goes on the agenda in a couple of weeks, uh, we probably don't need to leave a whole 15 minutes. For it. Correct. Okay. All right, thank you, Matt. And you're, the commission was also just asking for a little bit more information on the planting plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can flush it out. It's not a problem. Yeah. And actually put put it on the plan, please. Yep, not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks. You too. Okay. Next up, 815 continued public hearing notice of intent 27 Maplehurst Road, Mass DEP 204952, demolition and reconstruction of a single family home and a septic system upgrade. Anyone here to speak to that? Hey, yes, Kyle Mann here, uh, property owner. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Kyle. Hey, um, thanks for the time tonight. So I had walked the site with um, Amy and another member of the board and um, gone over a few things. <clears throat> um, and we we revised the plan to show some uh, drainage around the existing driveway or the, the proposed driveway, proposed dwelling, and uh, the septic system wall to capture any rain runoff and and things like that. Um, again, we're taking the, uh, the existing septic system that's in the 50 foot buffer, taking it out and um, keeping the existing, the whole proposed dwelling out of the 50 foot buffer here. Um, so I addressed the comments that, <clears throat> that we had discussed when we walked the site and, um, and this is the revised plan here in front of, <clears throat> I'd have to share my screen here, I guess, if you wanna, should I bring the plan up? I, I would. Yeah. <clears throat> now is Matt gone? Did Matt leave me? I don't know. <laughs> Is Matt the Matt? You're still. Are you looking for Matt Morrow? I don't know. I, I didn't know if he left me or if he. Yes. Here. No, I'm here. Oh, He's okay. There. All right. <clears throat> you you speak better to this, Matt. So I was. I, I didn't see you on here. So. I'm sorry. I was. I was actually um, on a phone call with my previous client who just called me. Hey, did um, some, does someone have a plan that they would like to share for the commission? Yes, we're trying to share that right now. I believe I have the latest iteration up. If you just want to give me a second, I'll do my usual rapid fire job here. That's the April 5th plan? That is okay. correct. What's this plan? April 5th. Yeah. Just bear with me for one second. Oh, wait a minute. I guess Kyle got it up first. Okay. Uh, yeah, Kyle, just change the orientation of it, please. Okay. That's it. Tell you, Melissa's doing all this. I have no idea how to do this. So, <laughs> thanks, <Okay>. Melissa. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> um, So here we are. So we had added um, this this stone infiltration basin. Essentially, it'll be two feet deep and uh, two feet wide, and it runs the whole driveway, uh, the walkway along, and then takes up complete underneath the deck. And then we also have 
the same thing proposed on the lower side of the wall for the septic system. Um, <clears throat> we actually, this house is basically a, a slab on grade here. So we, we got rid of the front stoop and that's just going to be a walkway now. So that, that landing pedestal and stairs are gone. Um, so it's just going to kind of blend in off the um, driveway here and walk right into the front door. So that kind of took away a little bit of grading and things like that. And uh, so with this plan, now, the only thing we have just a, a little bit of this drip edge that kind of goes over the line here, but there's no grading or anything proposed inside the 50 foot buffer. Um, and we're, we're hoping to catch all water in this base, in this infiltration basin here, um, from runoff from the driveway, slow down anything from the roof, uh, and essentially gather everything from the roof as well. Um, do you have any questions, um, in regards to this? this new proposed plan? I'm gonna grump at you a little bit. Uh, we do have expectations in terms of uh, coloring for, for plans and wetland buffers and, and so on. <clears throat> really tough to follow. I'm sorry, what was that? We've, we've got standards in terms of uh, drawings and line types and colors and so on so that we can actually interpret what's going on in a drawing. Re really tough to follow along here with just the black and white drawings. Um, uh, it, just a word for note in, in terms of uh, future applications. And, and okay, so yeah, I'll, I can, I'll add a little color uh, in the future before. I'll bring my cursor along right here is the, uh, the wetland line that we, we've gone over in the last uh, meeting when we discussed um, and then this, where my cursor is here is the, uh, what is that? The 25 foot, <laughs> the 25 foot, zone the 25 count. foot. Yeah. And then that's the 50 here. And then hundred is all the way on the other side of the property here. Um, so that's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty that then when we walked, obviously the, um, that wetland line was pretty defined. Um, the, this line here was pretty defined and agreed with Amy and the, uh, the member that walked with us as well. Um, keep in mind this whole area here is existing lawn. Um, that that's maintained area. It's grass. Um, it was clearly mowed and maintained. So we're not going to be doing anything different in this area. Um, everything we're doing is here out of the 50 foot buffer. <clears throat> Kyle, you, you keep saying that, but your drawing shows that you're within the 50 foot buffer in some places. So I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling. Well, yeah, sorry. So we have to abandon the existing septic system that is in the 50 foot buffer. So by mm -hmm. Title V code, regardless of a new dwelling or, you know, or whether the existing state or new dwelling was built, that would have to be abandoned. So yes, we are going to be inside, sorry, for the abandoning of the existing septic system. Okay. And then once you do that, are you going to, pull the erosion controls back up or are they going to stay? No, because we'll need to, partially. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll like hydro, we'll hydro seed and stabilize that area, you know, at the end and blend everything in during construction. So, I mean, we could, but I would say, you know, it'd be, our efforts would be futile as far as then we'd have the hydro seed on the opposite side of the erosion control. So if there was any runoff, the erosion control wouldn't be there to gather that. So I would say that that would probably maintain like that, you know, until grass is established. So uh, I think that would be the safest bet for the wetlands anyways. And Commissioner, just for the record, um, this is Matt Morrow again. I did submit the waiver proper waiver request form for the work for the septic system within the 50 foot zone. And the relocation of the driveway out of it. Correct. Yes, thank you, Amy. Yeah. Oh, okay, now, I'm, now that makes sense. The relocation of the driveway. I'm, I was still struggling, Kyle, with the erosion controls um, along the removed driveway. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this now, is the no, drive. Okay. Yeah, to be removed there. So um, that's yeah. That'll be state. That'll be lawn area. So that'll get back to you know a natural state. So essentially, the work that is within fifty would be the replacement of the septic system with the new system and the reduction of impervious by the removal and relocation of the driveway outside of the 50 foot zone. Yes, 
Yeah. And I would also recommend that that at least maybe a, a condition be if uh, you also moved is that the um, there's what was it like a table and chair like a little seating area out basically in the wetlands yeah right around in there yeah back in this area here there yeah. was some garbage back there yeah that all that yeah that all that be pulled out yeah and uh, there there was actually we discussed during the sidewalk there was some uh, heavy bittersweet in here that I'll, I'll cut out by hand and uh, and and remove as well too um, that was pretty invasive this this tree here proposes actually a very dead, um, dead tree with bittersweet all around it too. So I'll, I'll clear that bittersweet out by hand and, and kind of clean, clean up that area of the invasive species that's there. So species. Kyle, do you have all your board of health permits? Yes. Okay. So are we prepared to close this this evening? Any other amendments? To your plan? Nope. Yeah, this is this is the final, this is the final plan that we've come up with here. So we're okay. hoping to move forward with this. If there's a commissioner in support, would someone like to make a motion, please? I'll move that we close the public hearing and issue an order of conditions for Mass DEP file number 204-0952. 27 Maplehurst Road. And issue a uh, waiver. With, with a waiver. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All right. Three. Roll call. Uh, Brian. Brian Crowley, aye. Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Chase. Chase Carver, aye. Kyle. No, Max, you'll die. Myself, aye. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thank you for your time tonight. Okay, opening the 8.30 continued public hearing request for amended order of conditions 9 air mass DEP 204-898. I'm bringing up the, the plan to share for that. So I'm, I'm Kyle Mann. Um, I'm under contract to purchase this property. I had been in to discuss um, this with you guys in previous meetings. We uh, we had a chance to walk the site with, I think most of the um, board members made it to, the, to that site walk uh, to kind of go over things. So <clears throat> we have um, all the revisions made for the plan. Um, today, I learned that the, uh, the the newest revisions just got submitted to green. So that that's the reason why those comments aren't back. Um, there's been a lot of conversation back and forth between green and Dillis and Roy to make sure that the, the revisions were done exactly to, to what they wanted to see. Um, so th those were submitted today. We were hoping to get them back for a planning board meeting that was scheduled for Thursday, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen, but um, they were, they were minor revisions in regards to the, uh, drainage swales down bottom. They wanted us to dig some, yeah. So some, these drainage ponds down here, they wanted us to dig some tessels, which we've done. Um, Greg did not have a chance to, to get those on the plan until and submitted until today. So, um, we're, we're waiting to hear back from green, but there was a lot of discussion back and forth. We were hoping to, um, move forward with the condition of, of having that stuff completed, um, and back before the approval at the, planning board meeting. Um, do you have any questions in regards to, to, to this and the, the updated plan? So it sounds like you won't have your feedback back from green until our next meeting on the 26th. Yeah. So we, we got the feedback and there were a couple more, there were a couple more minor comments um, that were, that, that have already been addressed and uh, resubmitted, but yeah, that I guess we haven't gotten the final Final, final comments or final, 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 final comments. Either way, um, there, yeah, there were a couple of things that they wanted us to address that have been addressed. Um, we just haven't heard back yet to okay. confirm. Do any of the commissioners have any questions based on the site walk or um, the latest version of the plan? No questions, sir. Just a note that I'm, I'm probably not inclined to move forward until we get the final sign off. Yeah, no, I, I agree. 
Anyway, I was going to say, I, I did have I a discussion with Tom Bigelow over at Green this morning about the comments, because um, what was remaining did not look particularly pertinent to me. So they are in good shape. They're not finalized. Okay. But there, so, there's no Nate red flags. Right. So Kyle, with your support, we're going to move this on to April 26th. Yeah, that, that's right. okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah. Okay. Uh, opening the 845 notice of intent. 628 Newtown Road, Mass DEP 204946, replace gravel driveway and with permeable pavers. John Field, I see that you're here. Are you here to address this? Yes, good evening. Okay, go ahead, John. So I submitted uh, a proposed sequence of operations or sequence of construction at uh, the request uh, from the last hearing. Wondering if you have any comments on that. I think we had also asked um, other commissioners that um, hadn't been by the site in a while. I know I, I've certainly driven by it and popped in a few times. So um, this has obviously been a, a long discussion and hope that we can come to some resolution this evening, but look forward to seeing if there's any commissioners with any questions or comments or anything for uh, for John. I did have one question, sorry, and that's the condition about no stockpiling soil aggregate. Um, the way that reads is, is no stockpiling, and I wanted to make sure that the applicant meant it as no stockpiling versus no stockpiling in a resource area. Given this property, I'm not sure there's a big difference between those, but... Um, I wanted to make sure there was clarity on that and everybody understood that no meant no anywhere on site. That, that is my understanding and, and uh, uh, that would be uh, um, that would be a condition of the project that there'd be no uh, stockpiling of earthen materials. There would be stockpiling of the uh, pavers. Understood. And uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I don't know how you would get this done otherwise. But where would the pavers go? There are they noted on the plan? Are they going to be on the left or the right front lawn? They're they're not noted on the plan, but I would anticipate that they would be if you're looking at the house from the road on the left side, closest to the wetlands. Uh, well, it's kind of the I, snow storage area. Yes, towards that towards that area uh, between the uh, garage and the. Uh, the snow storage area. John, what do you anticipate from start to finish would be a reasonable time frame for completion in a perfect world? Uh, in, in a perfect world, I would say that, that it would probably be uh, several days to, to maybe, uh, uh, I, could, I could see 10 or 10 days of, of work. What I anticipate is is a relatively small amount of work being done each day, so that that the excavated material is is loaded onto a truck and hauled out, and then the appropriate uh, aggregate is hauled in, laid down, and uh, uh, compacted, and the pavers installed. So I, I guess this to me is just obvious, but that there will be no vehicular traffic going to the house on the days that this site is open. Yes. Okay. I, so I just want to be clear that, that I have always had concerns about stability and unearthing something that's, you know, finally been stable with those banks. So I hope extraordinary care is going to take um, place here. And I would like to make it conditioned that, they can't start until we actually look at the weather forecast and start it and finish it. I'm very concerned that we're going to have this open and something's going to come up and it's not going to get done. Um, so much so I want to make sure that we're not stockpiling those bricks more than two weeks. So I really feel as though there, there needs to be incentive to start and finish. Sarah, would something like a condition that requires the applicant to notify the conservation agents, uh, you know, 
24 or 48 hours before commencing. Oh, it, 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 absolutely, Chase. And I, I would even think 48. So that way people can look specifically at the weather patterns. And uh, I would really, really make sure that the order of conditions has um, resources for whether it's extra wattles or however the erosion control is stated that there's going to be extra available. doesn't have to be on site, but it needs to be pretty darn close. Understood. Amy, I'd also like to add a condition here to the order of conditions, as long as the other uh, commissioners are good with it, um, <clears throat> to ask the applicant to minimize refueling on site and to the extent that refueling of equipment needs to occur on site, it occurs essentially at the top of the driveway. I, normally, I would require it outside of the resource area, but uh, uh, chase i would i would disagree i i don't want any refueling on that none at all no <clears throat> i i yeah i what i anticipate is a, a rubber track uh excavator and um I have it hauled off of the site loaded onto a trailer and hauled off the site if it needs to be refueled or maintained okay i'm even happier with that John, will you elaborate a little bit on your second bullet under post-construction where you talk about um, the maintenance, the seasonal vacuum removal of debris and, and smaller sediment? I'm interested, interested to hear exactly what that looks like. Is that once a year with a some kind of vacuum truck or more of a handheld portable push vacuum or what, what do you see happening there? At a minimum, uh, a billy goat type of a uh, handheld um, uh, vacuum similar to a large lawnmower. Do you think an annual basis for that would be uh, appropriate? Yes. Okay. Brian, that brings up a good point. How do you hold the conditions to that with an annual report? I mean, you're not wanting the Amy, the agent, to have to go out to check on this every year. Is this too going to have an O&M on it, on a residential? I feel like a formalized O&M report is probably overkill for this, but I, I would like to memorialize, um, you know, with with this application that the the applicant is committing to this, this um, once per year uh, O&M on, on the pavers. So... In perpetuity, so you have to, once the certificate of compliance is complete, it's going to have to be on the deed. But I guess I just don't know how you you hold someone, whether it's this owner or the next owner, to, to fulfill that. Amy, maybe you can enlighten us on what you're thinking. Well, with, with SWIPs, um, you know, which, which are obviously a lot bigger than this, they have to maintain the records on site, which could certainly be asked of the property owner so that, especially, I think that if a new owner comes in, they, they can prove that it has been maintained or if the commission asks for it, the records are there. Rather than sending it to me, I mean, sending it to me once a year is great, but I'm not going to remember once a year that I should be getting this thing coming in. Um, so they should be maintaining the files. I think available upon request is reasonable. Um, you know, if anybody on the commission or, or in the town drives by and, and things don't look as they should, then that'll raise a red flag and, and we can um, then approach uh, whomever the, the landowner is at that time and, and request those records of the, of the maintenance. And, and I think at, at the least, I can also flag the view permit files that this driveway needs special maintenance. Okay. Any other commissioners have any questions for John? And the um, the other conditions that were kind of uh, discussed previously was the biodegradable fuels. Chase, you brought that up. Um, and I don't know if it's really a condition or at least a heartfelt consideration to maximize the spacing between the pavers. I think they're standard though, aren't they? Isn't that what we concluded? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. 
John, that area that the pavers are going to be stockpiled in, is that vegetated? It's gravelly. It's not, uh, it's, it's not mowed lawn. Okay. So we want to make sure that that's also neat and tidy once, once all the pavers are in. Obviously, no dumpsters on, on site, no containers, things like that. Understood. Commissioners, what else have we not thought of? Okay, where would we like to go from here? So commissioners, it's up to you. Happy to make a motion to uh, close the public hearing. If that sounds good to you. And of course, this comes with a waiver. <clears throat> Thank you for the reminder. Hear, hearing no opposition, I'll uh, <clears throat> move to close the public hearing and uh, issue an order of conditions uh, and approval of the uh, local uh, bylaw waiver for 628 Newtown Road, Mass DEP file number 2040946. Uh, just one thing before we uh, second and vote, uh, what were the grounds for the waiver again for this particular project for granting it? Um, it was mostly improving the, the condition where the, the gravel is migrating. Yes, improving the condition of the resource area from receiving sediment. The protection of it. Do we have fact? Do we have fact that it has degraded and gone into a resource area? Based on, I mean, comment? when I took a look at it, Sarah, it, it, it's clearly gone somewhere. Um, exactly. I, 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 whether it's gone into the resource area or not, I, I don't know. Um, but when I went by to take a look at it, uh, it, it, it's not a a full course of stone across it. And so I, it's my sense that this uh, ever so barely qualifies for the uh, Commissioners, how would you like to proceed? I'll second Chase's motion. All right, uh, we'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Chase. Chase Garbag, aye. Sarah? Sarah Seward, nay. Kyle? Kyle Maxfield, aye. Brian? Brian Crowley, aye. Myself, um, aye. Uh, so that was one, two, three, four ayes and one nay. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, next. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to open two minutes early. Public hearing notice of intent. Town Forest and Balsam Trails, um, no disclosed DEP number, construction of boardwalks. And simultaneously, we'll be discussing the Cooper Wellington bike trails as well, construction of boardwalks. Okay, so uh, totally unprepared for this. Um, so let me start with the conversation. I'm Amy Green, I'm the conservation agent. So these are two applications for boardwalks, um, seven boardwalks at Town Forest in the Balsam Trail extension, and one, frankly, after the fact boardwalk at uh, between Cooper and Wellington. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the uh, the Town Forest and Balsam Trail ones. Um, and if you give me a second, I can try to pull up the maps. All right, so um, this is very similar to what you saw before in uh, the town forest. And I don't think I can rotate this, so I apologize for that. Where am I? 
So this is balsam down here, and this is all the K Durkee development, um, Foster Street here. So the trail would be coming from Balsam Lane here. Um, I do have a grant application to pay for some of this, which would include a parking lot outside of the buffer zone. And the trail will come up through here and then connect into Town Forest proper through here with the two Town Forest boardwalks being up in this particular parcel. So these are the Town Forest boardwalks. The yellow stars are the, um, the four that you've already approved. Boardwalk five, I don't think, and eight, we don't really need something at. Um, so although those are kind of crossings, nothing structural is gonna be going in there. And boardwalks one through four are complete. And um, one is certainly primitive and four is a nice serpentine one, very long if you had a chance to get out there. So six and seven would allow for this loop uh, to be finished within the town forest and also set up for hopefully potential um, connection through Healy Corner and over to uh, Newtown Hill through that direction. And then coming down here is where you connect into the Balsam Trails. Which again, here you're coming in from Town Forest there'd be a loop of balsam trails and then coming down that way towards the parking lot. And there'd be, the biggest crossing is probably at boardwalk one here. Um, boardwalks two, three, and four are actually pretty small. You can almost jump across those now, but not quite. And then five is, is a little bit longer. The pictures don't always necessarily tell you the whole thing, but this is where up in town forest, Crossing six would be, got everybody's pictures in my way. Seven, which is very similar. And then down in um, Balsam, crossing one, which is the bigger one. Wetter than it looks in that. And then two and three, which is just barely a stream through here four, which is this in a wet season, so you'd see a little bit better what is in there. And then coming around the other direction is five, crossing over there. And these would be done, I'll just give an, an example here, um, using the, uh, the, the culverts as uh, foundations for the boardwalks as we did at Cloverdale. And we expect whether or not we get the grant, um, it'll be volunteers um, building all of these except for Balsam Trail number one, uh, which Dana Gray has put in um, a cost estimate to build that one, um, especially if we get the, the grant to go with it. And that's the basis of those. Do you want, me, you want to ask questions about that one or don't we move on to the Wellington piece of it? I think let's see if there's any questions on on this one first, if we can. I think you might have a and a butter here too. Okay, I'll open up if commissioners or butters have any questions on what has been presented so far. Hi, this is Cynthia Virtue. I'm in a butter. I'm mostly just watching for information. I think boardwalks are great. Cynthia, can you state your residence, your location, please? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm at 202 Foster Street, which um, is a long skinny parcel that has a bunch of that wetland at the um, southern end of it. Uh, I don't think your path is coming actually close to our stuff, but it seemed like yeah, a good yeah. chance to educate myself on how this goes. We've only been resident a couple of years. That's great. We, we, we did we look at alternatives where we would have done the, the parking lot right near your, your house um, on Foster with what would have been a serious boardwalk across the wetlands down behind you. Um, yeah. But it seemed better to come into Balsam where it's a little bit quieter. Yeah. And you would have been going on top of that um, uh, telecommunications line yeah. or whatever that is that's, yeah. that's there. It, it would have been problematic taking down a lot of trees. So yeah. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for uh, doing the mailing. I know you're required, but I appreciate it. 
Okay, so Amy, if we don't have any questions, let's move on to Cooper Wellington. So um, I can't do two things at once. So I'm either gonna have to change this or talk to you. So hang on a second here. So Cooper Wellington is the proposed eventual, maybe a um, bike trail. Uh, this current work is all on the Wellington parcel. And there's a site location. So again, the trail is between Goldsmith and um, Great Road and comes down here. Obviously this is an old aerial photograph because it doesn't even show the Cooper development on there. But there it is a little bit better on an aerial photograph. I think a lot of you have probably already been out, been out there in the past. You can see this was the, um, the car path that's sort of always been there. Uh, Steve Marsh had removed the two or three culverts that were here because they were really blocking flow and causing some erosion. And uh, there was a miscommunication about what he could and couldn't do. So he has gone in and built the crossing um, before the permit was issued. And that's not his fault. It was a miscommunication. I will say that by the luck of the draw, maybe or just because Steve knows what's needed, he did span the entire streamway and there's the um, expected height you would want in there. So there is upland passage on either side of the stream, um, gravel and stabilized so that wildlife can still get through underneath. And this is looking from Cooper. So this is the part of the trail that um, Cooper had done as part of their project, going to the bridge and then out to Wellington back there. Th this has been finished here. Um, so that's that one. And actually Steve also did in this area, which was, which was sort of the, the kind of mow field, um, he built a little, which is outside the resource area, a little bench area and he had some, I'm not sure the survivor and I had some damaged trees left over that he, he planted down there. So, so he's got a nice little sitting area down there too. Thank you for the photographs. Anyone have any questions? Just one question about uh, both of them in terms of material or uh, equipment used to install. It, we're going to essentially use the same processes, not just uh, construction, but processes that we've used in the past. Um, essentially manual construction. Exactly. Yeah. Not a lot of heavy equipment or anything. Yeah, there, there might, um, Jim and might bring in his tractor with a cart to, to get the materials down there initially um, on the mm -hmm. existing trails. But other than that, no, nothing else. Do you need anything from us? I need two order conditions, please. And waivers. I, I, did, I did submit the waivers with, you know, the, the public interest. Um, especially to stop the trampling in the wetlands and to get the people out there. Yep. But we don't have numbers yet. I say you don't have numbers yet, right? That's true. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have numbers yet. So. Okay. All right. So let's just put it on for the 26th. And you will right, be seeing, right. you'll be seeing That's another right. one of these. Unfortunately, I couldn't get them in all at the same time um, for an area over near uh, behind the orchard. Okay. We can put that on the next one. Yeah. Well, we've certainly had a lot of discussions tonight. Anybody have anything else? Any site walks? Amy, Amy, anything that we need to have on our radar? Um, Orla Harvey is still here. I don't know if if you if he's really still here or not. Um, but otherwise, we had the um, what was the thing we skipped over? Yeah. No, I am here. Okay. Amy, what, so, was it that, what was it that we skipped over? Uh, the Williams what, Conservation, Williams Conservation Restriction. Restriction. Um, so I'm working with uh, the Littleton Conservation Trust and Town Council to get that lined up. It should be fairly straightforward. You had voted uh, some funds to uh, pay some money to do the basically the, the baseline documentation report, which I'm trying to get 
at least halfway done before the end of this fiscal year. The only thing I wanted to mention is that right now, um, Board of Selectmen, Select Board um, controls, owns the property. Uh, so town council actually thought it was best if they maintain control of the pro property so that they sign the uh, conservation restriction. And after that, it would, could be turned over to um, Conservation Commission because otherwise there'd be this whole process beforehand. And town council was starting to say she didn't think that conservation, that CONCOM could sign off on a CR for property they hold. Um, so well, she thought it's best if there's a little bit of a distance. But who's going to hold the CR? Isn't the trust? Conservation trust. It's, I mean, we've done this numerous times. Why does it change now? I don't think, well, actually the, the trust, the only place it, it has right now where the trust has the CR on conservation land is in Cobbs. And that thing is ancient. Um, so yeah. I, I don't know if, if you particularly cared or not, if, if the transfer, if, if I push hard to see if the transfer can happen now or just wait until after the CR is done. Either way, it is, it is uh, land use code for conservation. It's not like they can do anything with it. Except maybe allow hunting. I'm surprised that that's under select board control, considering yeah. that it was purchased with uh, CPA monies. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to finish the conversation with him, and I'm meeting Kathy Stevens tomorrow to go over some of this stuff. Um, yeah, because I thought CPC money meant. Yeah, typically. It, it, yeah, so I wasn't sure, I, and I couldn't remember if CPC just money just meant it needed a conservation restriction or if the Conservation Commission had to have care and custody. I, I know that a CR has to be placed on it, but I'm pretty sure also that it, if it's open space, it would automatically go to conservation, but that's weird. Yeah. I, well, it's like, it's like town forest. Town forest is conserved land. They can't do anything, but it is under the care and custody of the select board. So it, it does happen. Um, I, I'll circle. I would move forward for us to get it as soon as possible. And that way we can work through the language of the CR. Which you would need to approve it anyway. So Right. Yeah. But at least we can keep that ball rolling and we're not waiting for someone else or some other board to do it when they have everything else to worry about. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't think there's any other updates. So, do I have a motion to close the meeting? Did you want to let Mr. I was going to say, were we going to chat about uh, 166? No. Well, I'd like to if I could for a minute. Um, I think my. So I, my uh, I want to add to order though, but we yeah. it has been requested for for them to do an official filing. So we've already had an informal discussion and an informal site mm -hmm. visit. So I, I asked the commissioners to be aware of that. So. Okay, does that mean I can't ask a question? I would defer to the commission for that. So abutters have not been notified. We've already had an informal discussion and an informal site walk. So typically we do that once. I'm, I'm happy to hear Barlow's question, Barlow. Okay. You may, it, my opinion is you may get an answer that says that bring it back under a formal file, but I, I'd at least like- Well, to I mean, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, okay. Um, my, I, I, I submitted a design. Um, I don't know if you guys got it. My plan B to put the building that I want to do or the addition. Um, away from the 50 foot setback line. And the question is, um, can we get actually, you know, get a backhoe in there, which would be going on the, on the wrong side of the 50 foot line? Cause there's no way to get back to where that is without being on, on or on the wrong side of the 50 foot line. So, I mean, it's from, from what I've been hearing um, 
you wouldn't allow a backhoe across a 50 foot line. We, we certainly consider when reviewing applications, not just the permanent structures, but the temporary construction impacts as well. I know that's kind of a non-answer, but we don't. Uh, don't okay, so I'm, but, I'm okay. But, but we consider not, both. If it's not a, you know, a, a blanket no, then I think we'll go ahead and then we'll come back with a, with a delineated wetlands and a real proposal. Are we still missing a certificate of compliance on that build as well? Or there was something, Amy, that we were still missing? Yeah, I believe the certificate of compliance is still outstanding. So that, that needs to be cleaned up first. So that, that would okay. need to be addressed first before. And right. I don't believe that right. they can go concurrently. Yep. Okay. I don't know what the story is with that. Uh, my client has said that he's yeah. is done. But if it's not done, we'll, I'll try again. Well, like, I, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be at the Registry of Deeds. It should be at the Registry of the Deeds, yeah. So. All right. Okay. He's Good a, luck. He's, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners? I can't believe you did all that and it's only 9.15. Feels like 10.15. I'm impressed. I will agree. All right. Anyone want to make a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right. At 9.15, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Right. Your your last roll call for the night, Andrew. Roll call. Last one. Uh, Chase. Chase, sorry. Brian. Brian Crowley, aye. Kyle. Oh, um, not too aye. Sarah. Sarah Seward, aye. Myself, aye. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you, Amy. I know you had a lot to take in tonight. Thank you for hanging in there. <laughs>